everyone, and welcome to Zephyr's Adjusted for Risk podcast from the shores of Lake Tahoe. I have a fantastic guest on today, and one that I have been looking forward to having on for some time. And, and to be honest with you, I'm not sure uh, the timing could be any better with alternatives like private credit and real estate, particularly commercial real estate on the minds of many. So with that backdrop, I think you will all enjoy today's guest and learn a lot from him as I know I'm going to, and it's going to be a very fun and engaging conversation. But first, uh, today's episode is sponsored by the award-winning Zephyr, which helps advisors, wealth managers, financial analysts, and investment professionals make more informed investment decisions. So enough from me, let's move along to the star of the show. I'd like to welcome Jeff Schwaber. Mr. Schwaber serves as the CEO or Chief Executive Officer of Blue Rock Capital Markets and oversees the company's capital markets, security sales, and distribution operations. As a 38-year veteran of the securities industry, um, Jeff's diverse career accomplishments include senior executive roles in several key areas of the investment and securities industries. Since 2003, Jeff has overseen the equity raise of over $24 billion, making him one of the most successful and highest capital raising executives in the history of the alternative investment industry. Uh, this is where it gets really exciting. Jeff started his securities career wholesaling, later becoming the national sales director for Star Partners, the largest independent financier of major motion pictures in the world, financing Warner Brothers and MGM uh, United Artists films, including Rain Man, Moonstruck, uh, Thelma and Louise, a fish, fish call, called Wanda. Uh, the Color Purple, Overboard, Spies Like Us, Little Shop of Horrors, Heartbreak Rage. It goes on and on. My favorite, Superman 2 and 3 and 4, Rocky and uh, James Bond's License to Kill. So really exciting. And dozens of others uh, that were credited with Academy Award wins in every major category, including Best Picture, Best Director, Best Actor. It just goes on and on. So very exciting. I've seen a lot of... Um, Interesting backgrounds. That was one of my favorites when I, I was talking to Jeff. So Jeff, tell us a little bit about yourself that um, might not be included in that bio above. And thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. No, Ryan, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. And um, I'm um, flattered and honored to be invited. And hello, everyone out there. We're going to spend some uh, some fun time here. And And as Ryan said, on a very timely subject. Um, yeah, something in my bio that might not be in there. I guess, you know, I would say that that my career, which I just I just got to relive a little bit of, um, I, you know, it more found me than than I chose it. And um, so after graduating from college, undergrad, I went to law school for a uh, a whole semester <laughs> before I dropped out and realized that it just wasn't for me. I broke a two generation chain of attorneys. And uh, I was I was very fortunate. I was you know wandering, trying to decide what I wanted to do, and I had the opportunity to get a real estate sales license, and and uh, and I got a job with a very prominent developer in Central Florida in Orlando, Winter Park area, mm -hmm. uh, leasing office and warehouse space. Um, and I I worked real hard, and I got the listing for this prominent office building in Winter Park, which that area that it's kind of their Rodeo Drive, if you will, called mm -hmm. Park Avenue. And I was handling the lease expansion negotiations for what was the largest financier of major motion pictures in the world. Uh, he had just done the original Superman film in a deal called Krypton Associates. And, uh, you know, as you said, subsequently, we did Rain Man and Moonstruck and all these pictures. And he and um, throughout the negotiation, he said to me, you know, Jeff, you're in the wrong business. I, I want you to hang up your real estate license and come to work for me. Yeah. I just secured a big deal with Warner Brothers. We have you know, 10 pictures, we're raising, you know, a couple hundred million dollars. And, um, and I did it and, and learned about the securities business and got licensed. And uh, that was, you know, back in really in the mid 80s, right before the 86 tax mm -hmm. reform. So fast forward about 40 years later, 
my career found me. So for those of you who are who are aspiring to something in the securities business, um, you know, keep your eyes open and your opportunities open and you never know where it where it might lead you. That's awesome. That's a that's a good story. Um, how were your um, dad or mom or grandpa or grandma feel about you not going into being finishing your law degree? That's a great question. I tell you, Ryan, it was one of the biggest blessings in my <laughs> life when I when I when I went home to Ohio at the time, yeah. and I had my tail between my legs, and I and I dropped out. My parents actually said to me, "You know, son, we knew law wasn't for you, but you." I had such deference and respect because we just wanted you to figure it out for yourself. You were meant to be in yeah. business or in sales or whatever it happened to be, and. Um, Talk about a blessing for your your parents to say that to you. So I've I've always had a um, what's driven me earlier in my career and still was a tremendous desire to make my parents proud for all of the sacrifices and everything that they gave me. And I know a lot of people feel that way. So um, I hope I've done that. that <laughs> that's awesome, Jeff. I'm sure you have um, CEO of a of a fantastic company. So thank you. For, that's a great story, Jeff. So. You have a long history then with real estate, um, you know, historically endowments, pensions, ultra high net worth investors were the primary investors in, in the alternative space um, right. that has started to really change as now retail investors have increased their portfolio allocations alternatives, although it's still small, maybe like 1%, right? right. Um, so there's a huge opportunity there. But what have retail investors really learned from those big players? Yeah, what a great question. Um, you're right. It is it is a small allocation. Um, you know, I, I think in order to understand sort of where we are and where we're headed, you have to understand where we came from. I sort of view it that way. First, you know, out the rearview mirror and then out the windshield. And if you go back like two decades ago, something like that, maybe two, two and a half decades ago, the, the big Ivy League endowments and big institutional investors, the, the big three Ivy Leagues are Yale, Harvard, mm -hmm. and Princeton. And they were probably about 60 to 70% invested in equities and maybe zero to 5% in alternatives. And then it flip-flopped. If mm -hmm. you look today, can you believe this? The big the Ivy League endowments are over 50% in alts mm -hmm. and maybe 15% in equities, where most of you out there are probably the, uh, the, the inverse of that. And- the the greatest story is they're they're they've just so significantly outperformed the average retail investor that you can't turn a blind eye. The old expression, if you take a look what the most successful people are doing and parallel it, chances are you'll achieve within a reasonable standard deviation similar results. And mm -hmm. the famed now late portfolio manager, genius David Swenson, took over the Yale endowment. It had maybe two, three billion in it 20, 30 years ago, whenever that was. And Studies have been done to see if if he would have maintained that same sort of modern portfolio theory, 60% stocks, 40 bonds, mm -hmm. a couple derivatives here and there, that the Yale endowment would have paralleled, you know, the efficient frontier and he would have gotten, you know, maybe uh, I think that two or three billion would be like 10 or 11, which is still phenomenal. That's a mm -hmm. 4x or 12, about a 4x return. Well, the, the Yale endowment isn't 10 or 11 billion. It's 40 billion. He has outperformed his peer group by, on average, about 500 basis points a year, 5% a year, which is absurd. Where they're doing eights, he's doing 13s. And he attributes that all day long to capturing the illiquidity premium, to investing in private institutional real estate. He quotes mm -hmm. frequently as being one of the big alpha generators, private credit. Now, he's also in venture capital and managed futures and timber and infrastructure. And all these are, are, are fall within the alternative bucket. But, um, you know, so I mean, just an enormous beat. When you see that, you have to have alternatives that take away the correlation to the public capital markets. I mean, you know, if you look back in history, folks, if, you know, I'll just go to the turn of the century. That's a funny thing to say, isn't it? The turn <laughs> to the turn of the century. And three times in 20 something years, we've lost half our money in the stock market. Right. Right after in like 2001, we had the double whammy of the 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 dot com, the, the, the dot com implosion, the tech wreck, they called it, and the terrorist attacks. Remember, the planes mm -hmm. hit the buildings in 01. So and and the major equity indices were down 50, 60 percent, just like that. And then the great financial crisis hit between 0709 
and the stock market went down 65%. And I'm sorry to make everyone relive this. And then, <laughs> then we had the COVID flash crash. Yeah. And I think the equities were down between 35 and 40%. It depends if you were in the NASDAQ or the S&P 500 or the Dow, but the blended average of the three major equity indices, we were down another 40 plus percent. So you put that together and three times in 20 years between 01 and 2020, we've lost half our money. And I got news for you folks that the Dow and the NASDAQ are not more credible places to lose half your money. I'm not consoled because my million is 500,000, but it was in the S&P 500. No. So you have to have something that zigs when everything else is zagging, something that is decorrelated. So what happens is as we get into those sell-offs, there's these algorithms kick in. They're, it's called in sympathy sell-offs and, 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 and securities trade away from their underlying net asset value. They just get decoupled and, and that implosion occurs. And once you're down 10, 20%, you don't sell out because you're afraid that you'll miss the rebound. So you go for that ride. It's just behavioral. Mm -hmm. So, you know, critical that. So I, I guess what I'm saying, Ryan, is, is that while the old adage, the 60, 40 portfolio is dead, that might be a little too exclamatory. Mm -hmm basically very well proven, very sophisticated studies that the addition of alternative investments, namely high quality private institutional real estate, credit, and some others make for a more efficient frontier, mm -hmm. aka you plug it into any of those models and there's risk allies and, and you know, there's just a hundred of them. And it shows that you will do two things. You will reduce your portfolio volatility. So instead of this Dramamine ride, it smooths it out and you will increase your returns. And that's what we're all, in essence, you know, trying to do. And so, so the issue was that only the largest pension funds and institutions and endowments and foundations and, and, and the big defined benefit plans like the GE or, or General Motors, whatever, had access to these. And it was companies like Blue Rock and some others that basically democratized the mm -hmm. process and is now giving retail investors access to... Um, superior performing, lower volatility, higher returning assets that were previously only available to the largest pensions. Such a great backdrop there, Jeff. Thank you for that going back in history there and where alternatives have been and now where they are today. You know, using Zephyr, That's we right. do a lot of, I've done a lot of um, studies with the efficient frontier and you're exactly right. When you add those alternatives, whether it's more, uh, you know, like REITs or something that's more available um, to the retail investor, that efficient frontier is moves to the north, um, up, upper left-hand corner. It plots 100%. upper left. And that's what you want to see, right? Um, Northwest. Northwest and, wins all the time. Yes, <laughs> you're exactly right. And that's what happens in, in every study. And regardless of really what time period you use. Um, so true that study happened. So alternatives, there is a big benefit there. One of the most popular and widely used alternatives is really some form of real estate. Um, what are some considerations a, a financial advisor should consider when looking to add real estate to your client's portfolio? Yeah. Yeah. Another great question. Wow. Um, well, I will tell you this, folks, you have to own real estate in a well-diversified portfolio if you're looking to outperform. Um, it's the third largest asset class in the world behind equities and fixed income. Some would argue the second. It just depends on how you classify it. Um, and if you think about it, it just checks kind of every box. It, it, it's not, you know, not to look at like an Enron. That's just too binary. That was a paper implosion. It can happen. A capital stack can implode. But this is a hard, tangible bricks and mortar asset. And when you look at what we're trying to accomplish as investors, aside from getting the Northwest quadrant, which is low risk and, re and volatility and high return, you want Northwest. You don't want Southeast. That's high risk, low return. That's the dumbest money. Uh, right above there is, is the Northeast quadrant, and that would be um, high risk, high return. It's Vegas. And, and Southeast is, is uh, low risk, low return, like bonds. You would expect it's generally commensurate. We want low risk, high return, but that defies the concept of risk adjusted returns. So what does real estate do for a portfolio? First and foremost, core class A stabilized real estate generates income and income always wins. It's called being yield protected. Our core flagship fund pays a five and a quarter distribution, for example. It's done it uh, every quarter without deviation for 41 consecutive quarters over mm -hmm. 10 years. Um, secondarily, 
real estate enjoys high tax efficiency from, you know, income that you receive from real estate is not to get too in the weeds here is kind of the capital market equivalent of EBITDA. It's your earnings, but it's before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. And those EBITDA items reduce the amount of taxable income you pay relative to that dividend or distribution you get. You know, in our case, it's, you know, in our core flagship fund, I think about 65% of that five and a quarter dividend has been uh, tax deferred for uh, for many, many years. So that's a taxable equivalent, almost like a muni bond equivalent of like, you know, 7%. It also tends to appreciate. There's never been a time ever in, in history that core class A institutional real estate did not appreciate to a new high, including this last uh, cycle. So chances are you'll be able to say that again in 10, 20, 30, 50 years. Um, so you got growth, you have income, you have tax efficiency, you have something non-correlated or associated with the public capital markets. And then even maybe most importantly, you have what's called a hedge against inflation. And, you know, that's purchasing power risk. If the dollar you have today stays a dollar, it will buy you less tomorrow, yep. period. Cost of milk, stamps, uh, movie ticket, you name it. Everything's going up, gas. So you have to grow with the rate of inflation. And, you know, it, it, some people consider gold a good hedge against inflation or, or um, precious metals. And they are, but gold don't row. Gold sits in a vault. It's not going to pay you a check. It's not generating income along the way. So when you add all those things together, um, you know, real estate is 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 a very, very important asset class to have for certain. A must in my mind. Fantastic. You know, you, I think you just hit home and um, especially for all of our listeners about inflation, right? You know, everyone's oh, looking yeah. for an inflationary hedge right now. So even though it is coming down and cooling, it is still well above oh, yeah. the 2% target, right? Oh yeah, I think we just broke five, which was a which was a victory because we peaked at nine. But you know, it it can be a little bit confusing, folks, because there's a lot of ways to own real estate. And generally, by the way, the net operating income, the NOI or the you know rental net rental income of real estate, has paralleled or exceeded the consumer price index. So that's proven to have an inflation hedge. But you know, it can be intimidating. There's so many ways to own real estate. There's there's these QP or qualified purchaser accredited deals where you have to have a million dollar minimum and and you're not really diversified. You have maybe one, two assets in that. You can go by public REITs. They trade on the exchange. You can buy it today and sell it today. But now you're correlated again to the public markets and, and you have much more volatility. Uh, most of those REITs are homogeneous REITs, meaning they're not diversified. Um, there are some diversified REITs that own office, industrial, retail properties, uh, hospitality, which is a fancy way of saying hotels, um, multifamily, which is which is uh, apartments, et cetera. But most are single asset class. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, you could own the real estate yourself and manage it. And then you deal with the three T's, as they say, tenants, taxes and toilets. Uh, and chances are you're going to buy, you know, not not so not high quality class A institutional real estate. And companies like Blue Rock and some of our peers have have created funds, 40 act mutual funds that are invested in private institutional real estate. And that's our favored nation asset class. So there's this sort of elite universe of the most prestigious private institutional equity managers of real estate. Think of like BlackRock and Clarion and Morgan Stanley Prime, a very celebrated $45 billion fund. So you have the best minds and the best managers, well diversified by geography, by asset class and by sector. And the minimum investment in any one of those funds until we sort of cracked the code and, as I said earlier, democratized it was ten million, five, ten million dollars $10 million. And even if you had it, they wouldn't take your money. It was only for CalPERS and Texas teachers and, and the Harvard Endowment. And for very low minimums, $1,000 in your qualified plan, your retirement plan, or $2,500 non-qual, you can invest in a highly diversified set of these managers. Our, our core flagship fund, which is called Blue Rock Total Income Plus Real Estate Fund, is diversified by 36 managers, has some great debt, and we're invested in, I hope you're sitting down, $390 billion worth of arguably the highest quality Class A institutional real estate. And, you know, diversified by manager, by sector, et cetera, very low levered in the high 20s, not like 50, mm -hmm. 60, 70% levered. And to put it in perspective, we, we brought that fund out in, in uh, 10 years ago, 
in, in I think it was 2012, we've had 10 consecutive years of positive returns. Not even COVID could pierce its armor. Last year, when when the 60-40 portfolio of stocks and bonds was down, what, 16, 18%? The bond market, the Barclays Ag was down 14. Uh, the NASDAQ was down 30. We were up 10% and really saved a lot of people's portfolios. So um, it's something that you should look into. It, your financial advisor, or you, you can make the decision whether it's 1%, 5%, 10 or 20% of your portfolio. But um, it, it generally will serve to do exactly what we said. It will lower portfolio volatility and likely increase returns, generate tax efficient income and grow um, over time. Great. Um, that's such a great conversation there just on the real estate market. We could, I think, dive in a lot more in terms of yeah. the commercial space and and stuff like that. But let's pivot a little bit and talk about another popular alternative um, that maybe you know retail investors want access to, but maybe it's a little bit harder to, and that's private investments. Um, right. You know, they're on the wish list of many investors, but like I said, it might be a little bit harder to gain exposure to. What makes private investments attractive and are they becoming more accessible to the retail investor? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's a good, yeah, it's, there's some mystique around it. For example, things like private equity, you know, you could ask 10 people what it is. You'd probably get 10 different answers and, and maybe some people wouldn't be able to answer it. So yes, certainly private investments are, are generally considered a complex product, a little bit more, mm -hmm. you know, definitely within the alternative space. And it, and it can take on a lot of monikers that the first benefit is number one, can you gain access to it? And mm -hmm. um, I mean, the first the first objective or, or the first uh, consideration is can you gain access to it? Um, secondarily, um, you know, the, the main benefit is obviously they are private. In other words, they do not trade on a major exchange. Mm -hmm. They're generally a little bit less liquid and you receive a premium, an illiquidity premium for that. But they tend to trade indicative of their underlying net asset value, whereas public real estate or public markets or private investments can deviate from their underlying nav. They can trade at premiums, they can trade at discounts, and they can get caught up in those whirlwind, you know, um, either bullish rises or mm. bearish sell-offs, more often the latter. Yeah. Um, so, but I think that the most significant consideration of private investments in my mind is that almost everything public and that most of our audience is invested in is 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 generally commoditized, right? If you have a well-diversified portfolio of mutual funds, you have uh, a good bit of your money in what we call large cap blend, right? There's the nine box, large cap, mid cap, small cap, growth value blend. And, and large cap blend is the S&P 500. So mutual funds have to, have to parallel the index in order to call themselves an index fund, but 96 or 7% of them underperform the index because of fees, and attempts at what's called smart beta, trying to beat the beat the index, and they generally don't. So that's where the old expression comes from. If you can't beat the index, just buy the index. Yep. Um, and there's plenty of index-based funds around. But if you look at the performance of those funds, if you look at the top quartile and the bottom quartile and the mid, there's just they're right on top of one another. There's no alpha. Alpha is excess return for superior management to be generated, and that's why people invest in private managers. The the a private manager can can significantly outperform its benchmark index as that real estate fund I mentioned. We beat the index by a couple hundred basis points net of all fees most every single year. Uh, in our biggest year, we were up 21.9%. This was 2021, 22% in a very low volatility real estate fund when the index was up like 16 or 17. Mm -hmm. um, so so there, there are managers by 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 you know, your sector weighting, how much in, in a real estate example, how much you were invested in industrial, which is a leading index or leading sector right now compared to office, which obviously is under scrutiny after uh, COVID. Yeah. Uh, so with manager selection and sector weighting and, and active management, um, private investments can generate some pretty significant alpha while also having the benefit of getting some of your money out of those public correlated vehicles. Perfect. Um, great, great explanation for private investments. You know, a lot of us, when we think of private investments, we talk about, um, you know, private equity. But how about private? There's private credit and private credit is becoming more popular. Why should investors consider adding private credit? 
Oh, to me, it's a must. Um, I think it's one of the most attractive areas in um, in the investment community in general, let alone alternatives. And and when you think about it, I mean, the credit markets are are measured in the trillions. They're they're gigantic. Yes. And and there's lots of you know, credit's a very broad term, ladies and gentlemen. So credit could be uh, corporate credit. Uh, and we'll talk about that momentarily. It could be real estate credit, which there's CMBS, which is commercial mortgage-backed securities, residential mortgage-backed securities. So you're financing um, bricks and mortar assets. Um, there's you know different areas of the bond market, et cetera. But mainly the largest component from of what you know banks, insurance companies, private equity investors, hedge funds, um, and and investment management firms are 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 looking at corporate credit. And if you if if you understand a corporate capital stack, the lowest position. The lowest priority and the highest risk is common stock. It's it's what we're all mo mainly invested in. We're willing to take the most risk. And then above that within the stack is is preferred stock or preferred mm -hmm. securities. It could be convertible preferred. There's there's a, a dozen ways to, to structure yeah. preferred. But um, and then you start and that's the equity stack. And then you start getting into credit. You start getting into debt right above there is MES. So you're above the equity, but you're the first in line to um, after that. And then you start getting into um, what's called subordinated debt or unsecured debt. And then you climb up the stack and you get into corporate bonds, which we're all mm -hmm. familiar with. And at the very highest portion of the cap corporate capital stack is what's referred to as senior secured credit or senior secured loans. And that's where we're focusing in and where a lot of investment managers are focusing in, both in credit funds, in CLOs, which is probably the most mm -hmm. exciting um, way and the most frequent way. 60 or 70 percent of all senior secured loans are held within collateralized loan obligations, which is just a, a mutual fund, a package of a couple hundred highly selected loans. And when you're invested in the top of the stack, folks, you are picture a hundred story building as a great visual. You you own floors 90 to 100. Nothing's impenetrable, but it's pretty darn close because as a senior and secured lender, you have a first lien claim on all company assets. You can claim their cash. You could pull it. Their cash, their inventory, their property, their plant, their equipment, their receivables, the goodwill in their name. Like the Rolls Royce name would probably sell for $2 billion. You can claim that. Mm -hmm. So most companies don't mess around with their senior secured debt. So, so you know, uh, our fund, for example, which is the Blue Rock High Income Institutional Credit Fund, and most of them are up there in the high single digits for income. That's a great yield for for top of the stack. You know, mm -hmm. not all eights are created equally. <clears throat> um, so there's lots of ways to invest in in corporate credit, but we're favoring senior secured loans. And and what a CLO does is is and and collateral CLO managers who eat, sleep, and drink structured credit is package up and diligence these companies on a highly selective basis. Maybe one in ten makes it in, and you have a you know two hundred loans in a portfolio and. And if that's a billion dollar portfolio, then investors come in and you can invest in floors 94 to 100 and you are the AAA tranche. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean you're getting the AAA loans. It means you get paid first. It's everybody has the same 200 loans, but you get a very low return, LIBOR plus mm -hmm. 100 basis points. That's great. And then you could be the AA and floors, you know, 94 and all the way down. Yeah. But the where we're favoring is the equity tranche of a CLO. You're, so you're still in, only in the highest portion of the stack. It's all senior secured, but your floor is 90 and 91. And the whole CLO, the vehicle, the structured vehicle is built to overpay the debt. So there's, there's you know, one and a half to two percent of, of, of reserve capital, what's referred to as the waterfall that yep. spills over to the equity. But the equity is only 10 percent of the whole CLO. So it's like a 15 percent yield. CLOs have been, the equity have been distributing about 15% for the past couple decades. And the smartest, um, you know, institutional investors are taking a piece of that sleeve because where else are you going to get mid-teens returns in the highest portion of the capital stack? So that's what you want to look for. Devil is always in the detail, folks. If you're looking at credit, make sure you're in a comfortable, safe position in the capital stack. Um, I they they're generally all floating rate loans, so they rise and give you inflation protection. And we're all afraid to flock to the bond market during this rising rate cycle because we know that price and yield move in inverse relationships to one another. It's bonds 101. So while the Fed was hiking, the our are the hundred thousand we had in the bond became worth 95, became worth 92, became worth 88, et cetera. 
And you, you don't flock to bonds to lose principal. That's your flight to safety, right? So corporate credit, I think, is an absolute must in a well-diversified portfolio and, and seek out a really learned institutional manager that's sort of been there and done that through multiple market cycles, has protected that principal and pays that wonderful yield. That's fantastic, Jeff. Um, great explanation. I love the, I love the, you know, story, you know, you're owning the floors 94 through 100. That's fantastic. Um, real quick, then we only have a couple of minutes left. And I think maybe what we should do is have another episode just on interval funds. You know, a lot of times sure. people say, okay, yes, that's fantastic. I want alternatives, but how can a retail investor gain access to alternatives and through innovation it's made it easier and one of those ways is interval funds so real quickly just what is interval funds we'll have to maybe dig deeper into it and yeah i think i can that. synopsize it uh pretty quickly so um and and most of these type of investments uh, well, well you can buy them if you have an institutional account at td ameritrade or schwab generally they're available through financial advisors so you'd have to go to, you know, we're, we distribute through Morgan Stanley, we distribute through LPL and Satera and advisor group and a couple hundred other ones and a, and a whole host of RIAs. So we'd have to be approved on your platform. But an interval fund, folks, is a 40 act mutual fund, just like the open ended funds that you're used to investing on, except for sort of one twist. So this is this is under the 1940 act. You have all of that corporate governance and visibility. The problem is, is we could not recreate the stability that is, for example, Blue Rock Total Income Plus Real Estate Fund in an open-ended fund because open-ended, your American funds or your Putnam fund, mm -hmm. they are limited to having only 15% invested in what's referred to as illiquid securities, Ryan. And the definition of an illiquid security is, can I go on my computer and go, okay, sell my thousand shares of Home Depot. Boom, it's gone. That's liquid. If you can't do that, or enter it to close that night, it's considered illiquid. And you can't sell 390 billion of real estate overnight. So interval funds allow for as much as 90 or 95% of your investments or more to be invested in illiquid securities. Mm -hmm. it, it has a five letter ticker symbol. It reprices every single day. The only difference is, is that your liquidity comes quarterly. Mm -hmm. So if you want to sell your security once a quarter, uh, most of them will, will have, um, they can't turn it off. And they will uh, generally redeem a minimum of a minimum of five percent, and it can be increased at the board's discretion, of the outstanding stock in any quarter twenty percent per year. Awesome. So, yep, that's generally the way an in, uh, in interval fund works. And I think there's a lot more there that we can probably dig into. I know they're getting more popular, in a, a great way to access um, alternatives. So. In closing, thank you so much, Jeff, for joining the show. Quickly, where can our audience get more information about Blue Rock Capital Markets? Certainly. Um, you can go to our website, uh, certainly, which is uh, uh, bluerock.com um, or bluerockcapitalmarkets.com. There's clickables for our investments. Um, each one of them has a prospectus. We absolutely recommend that you review the prospectus in detail and understand the risks associated with it because our funds do have risk. And um, and uh, make sure that it's uh, suitable for you. But um, there's a whole host of investor information on the website, and we'd be um, we'd be delighted to um, further assist your education. White papers and educational materials as well. I have been on your website, and there is a lot of thought leadership on your website. In about that's um, nice of you to say. <laughs> yes, about uh, interval funds and you know, investing in commercial real estate and alternatives, fantastic resources there. So thank you, everyone. Thank you again, Jeff. I really appreciate it for listening to this episode of Zephyr's Adjusted for Risk podcast. You can watch all of our podcasts on the Adjusted for Risk YouTube channel, as well as on Spotify and iHeartRadio. Thank you very much. Have a fantastic rest of your day.